Why did George R. R. Martin call his series A Song of Ice and Fire? The ice and fire part is pretty self-explanatory, but why is it a song? For me, the answer lies in the relationship between history and mythology. George R. R. Martin is often praised for primarily drawing on real history to create the stories of Game of Thrones, as opposed to mythology like many other epic fantasies. But Martin doesn't just use history. His novels are a commentary on how we understand history, and how history can transform into mythology. The people of Westeros are obsessed with their place in history. I will not become a page in someone else's history book. It's the family name that lives on. It's all that lives on. They will sing about the Battle of Winterfell until the Iron Islands have slipped beneath the waves. The problem is that they talk about songs and history as if they are the same thing, but they are not. Songs are entertainment first, and historical record second. They are not beholden to the facts. King Robert constantly confuses the two and often waxes on nostalgically about the wars he once fought. <laughs> Those were the days. Which days exactly? The ones where half of Westeros fought the other half and millions died, all before that. When the mad king slaughtered women and babies because the voices in his head told him they deserved it. Or way before that, when dragons burned whole cities to the ground. Easy, boy. Robert romanticizes the past, but there is a huge divide between the chivalrous world of the songs the man fair and, the maiden fair. and the cruel, random, and evil world of Westeros. Songs provide relief from this world, but they can also warp our perception of history, and it is for that reason that they are vulnerable to manipulation. After slicing a history book in two, King Joffrey enjoys a cartoonish reenactment of the War of the Five Kings. In it, Joffrey is presented as a courageous hero, his enemies inept clowns. But we, the audience, know the truth. We know that the songs, the plays, the statues, and the stories are all a lie. In fact, the greatest power that the Iron Throne gives is the ability to rewrite history. Someday, you'll sit on the throne and the truth will be what you make it. This is why rulers rightly fear the power of songs and stories. Songs are a threat to the narrative of the ruling house. One of Joffrey's first acts as king is to have a musician's tongue ripped out for singing a song that insinuates that Cersei killed Robert, which is the truth, but it challenges the narrative that the Lannisters want to maintain. Meanwhile, the lyrics of the Lannisters' unofficial anthem, The Reigns of Castamere, essentially boils down to DON'T MESS WITH THE LANNISTERS. That's the song that they want you to sing. This is also why there is such an emphasis on nicknames in the series. They reduce people to a single characteristic and are used to intimidate others or to disempower an enemy. Power resides where men believe it resides. And songs, stories, nicknames, and even the house sigils are all tools that influence the those beliefs. In fact, the entire kingdom relies on these fabricated histories. Do you know what the realm is? A story we agree to tell each other over and over till we forget that it's a lie. And there is a mountain of lies that the Lannister regime relies on to hold on to power. For the country to be at peace, for instance, the truth about Joffrey and Tommen's heritage has to be ignored by everyone. So, in Game of Thrones, we are presented with a cruel and punishing world where the only comfort for most people are the stories told in songs. These songs are more powerful than actual facts and have an immense level of influence over both the powerful and the powerless. While we get to see how the actual events of the story play out, we are also presented with an alternative version which mythologizes real history into a narrative that serves the ruling class. So when we read the books or watch the show, we are not actually witnessing a song of ice and fire. Not yet anyway. We are seeing the real history on which a song will later be sung. How accurate the song is will depend entirely on who wins the Game of Thrones. And that's an important lesson because how much of our own history is really just a wishful narrative created by the powerful? Because what Game of Thrones has proven to us time and time again is that what actually happened often doesn't matter nearly as much as the story we are given the permission to tell. Now, as you probably know, Game of Thrones is largely based on the War of the Roses, a period of dynastic struggle in medieval England. I find the series more satisfying when I know more about the history it's based on. And if you want to know more about that history, then check out the documentary called The Real War of Thrones on CuriosityStream, the sponsor of this episode. CuriosityStream is a streaming service with over 2,000 documentaries about history, science, technology, and more. 
In The Real War of Thrones, you'll get a great primer on the Hundred Years' War and the Game of Thronesy political and military history of medieval France. My favorite part is when this guy is getting knighted and the king really smacks the sword down hard on him and gives him a slap to the face. Someone please tell me if this is historically accurate. Access to the entire catalog only costs $2.99 a month, but the first 30 days are free if you sign up with my link at curiositystream.com slash justright and use the promo code justright. Thanks for watching and keep writing everyone.